Hi, I'm Wendy Gilch, founder of Selling Later, and here are four consumer issues in real estate that you need to know about before you get into the market. While there are plenty of news articles about mortgage rates and the giant things that can affect the market, there are four things that don't always get discussed that, in our opinion, can really impact a consumer's chance to buy or sell a home. We feel these four categories of referral lead generation, agents, iBuyers, and investors are creating, in our opinion, a less accessible and more expensive marketplace for consumers in real estate. So let's talk about referral lead generation. Referrals is when you send a client to someone and whoever is receiving that client as an agent agrees to give that referred person back a percentage or flat fee amount of the commission. But according to Home Openly, they estimate that we as consumers overpaid $15 billion in commissions last year simply because of how we found our real estate agent, mostly hidden behind websites that offer to find you the best agent for free. And there are three categories that play this referral lead generation game, the aggregators, the brokerages, and the individual agents. The most impactful and most expensive to consumers, in our opinion, comes from the aggregators. They do not buy or sell homes, and they only sell leads to real estate agents. When they sell you, the consumer, as a lead to a real estate agent, they're getting a commission percentage of 25 to 38% when that agent closes on the home. These are your Zillows, your Realtor.coms, your Home Lights, your Dave Ramsey, your effective agents, et cetera. There's plenty of them. Now, there are parts of Zillow and Realtor.com that are a flat fee, $100, $500, $1,000, $10,000 a month to be able to connect with you, the consumer. But Zillow and Realtor.com are shifting their position to focus more on referral lead generation, which we'll get into in a minute. And when we talk about brokerages, there are traditional brokerages that will pass you along to another agent in a different city to collect a referral fee. Uh, But mostly when we talk about brokerages, we're gonna be looking at Redfin. And this is Redfin without the savings. And there's also individual agents, which is a smaller section, uh, which really we're looking at social agents. So those that hide on social media, create a mass following and offer to help you find an agent. They're getting 15 to 25% of the commission uh, when they connect you to someone. And you'll see this a lot in groups, especially on Reddit forums, where people will specifically sit in certain real estate groups and message you to help you find an agent. So let's talk about aggregators. So currently in Denver and Raleigh, if you, the consumer, uh, connect to an agent through Zillow, that agent will be paying 35%. Zillow does have this in multiple other markets uh, mixed in with their monthly pay to play. So for right now, there are two markets that are referral only with plenty more to follow, I'm sure. So here's what happens. So if I'm going to sell my home and I get an agent through Zillow, that agent will likely tell me they'll list my home for maybe two and a half, 2.75% commission, not including the buyer side commission. We're specifically looking at the listing side when you sell your home. If I sell my $350,000 home at 2.75 commission, the agent's going to make $9,625. But the minute I close on my home, Zillow is the first person to get paid out of the commission. And so Zillow will take $3,368 and then the agent will have to pay their broker. So wherever they work, who they work for. Now this can be a flat fee. It can be anywhere from five, 10, 15, 20, all the way up to 60% of whatever they make. So for an average, we'll say this agent has to pay their broker where they work 30%. And so the agent's walking away with $4,381 after everyone gets paid right after you close. But when we talk with companies like Home Openly and what Selling Later is building, you have to look at commissions a little bit different. If you would just talk to an agent directly, so without these referral platforms, you could easily find an agent that would list your home for 2%, which means they'd make $7,000, but there's no referral fee in play. And so their broker would get a little over $2,000 and your agent would walk away with almost $5,000. And so even though you are paying your agent $2,600 less, they're still walking away with more money. 
And these platforms hide behind free rewards and top earner gimmicks. But what they're not telling you is the top 5% of agents are the top 5% of agents who are willing to give up a referral fee to get you as a lead. And they're also starting to offer you cash rewards like realtor.com. But is the reward worth it? Here's an example of a $750 cash reward if I use a realtor that I got connected through through realtor.com to buy this house. So let's look. At 3% buyer commission, my buyer's agent would get $7,470, but realtor.com would get almost three grand of that commission. And so your agent, before they even pay their broker, is getting like $4,600. But how kind of realtor.com to give you $750 of the almost three grand they made off that agent uh, that they say you can receive within 60 days after you close, even though realtor.com took that payment uh, the minute everything closed. And so let's look at this again. There are 40 states that allow buyer rebates, which means the agent can give you a flat fee or a percentage of whatever they earn to put towards your closing cost. Um, that's how most do it. I know some can cut a check, but mostly you'll see this as using something to apply to a closing cost. So when we talk about buyer rebates in past history, sometimes you could find an agent that would rebate you up to 25%. And in this market, that might be hard, but let's just look at a realistic option here. So at 3% also with no fees, your agent still makes more money. Uh, before their broker split, they're making almost $1,000 more and they're able to rebate you $1,800. Let's go one further. If they rebated you 20%, they would still make more money and you would get about double of what the reward would be through realtor.com. And even at 15%, your agent's walking away with almost two grand more and you still have over $1,000 rebated you towards closing. So which companies are doing this? If you look towards the bottom left-hand corner and the more left you go, the more a referral fee these platforms collect. If you look at Realtor.com and Zillow in the top left, you'll see the red flag because this is where they used to sit. Uh, and all of their lead generation came from these monthly subscriptions. But you need to pay attention to the bottom left. The Op City program and the Flex program through Zillow and Realtor.com is where they're focusing now. And at the end of last year, Realtor.com had just recently rolled out this Op City program in multiple cities. And in their earnings report, remember, it's News Corp. It's not Realtor.com. It's News Corp that's making this money. Uh, and in their earnings report, talked about how their new program made 30% of their sales already. And as I mentioned, Zillow has rolled out this program to multiple cities, but it's exclusively doing referral programs in two of them with plenty more to follow. But what you also want to notice is that these companies are all info wall. So you can't just go on and search for agents. They're likely going to give you two or three uh, because they need to track who you close with so they can get their money. But remember, a lot of these companies have affiliates. And so your data is well beyond worth just the referral fee because they can also share it with affiliate companies and sell you in their pipeline for many more services. So let's talk about brokerages and referral fees. The biggest one that does this is Redfin. Here are two great examples of properties in Pittsburgh that are a five minute drive apart. One offers you about $500 reward if you buy with Redfin. The other one, a much lower priced home, does not offer you any savings and actually doesn't even connect you with a Redfin agent. It connects you with a partner agent who works somewhere totally else and is not a part of the Redfin brokerage but that partner agent will pay Redfin $1,000 when you close. Go one step further. Here are two properties in Atlanta that are one minute apart. The home on the left, you get a $900 rebate uh, if you buy with this Redfin agent. But on the right, you don't get any savings and you actually get a Redfin partner and that partner will pay Redfin most likely around $2,331. Redfin was quoted in one of their earnings calls last year talking about how these partner transactions have a very high gross margin because the cost to serve the customer comes from the agent they send you to and not someone from Redfin. And so you have to ask, 
if this agent's giving you $2,331, why can't I still have savings? And let's go a little further. Let's get wild here. Look at this property for $2.6 million, almost 2.7. Uh, and if you buy with a Redfin agent, uh, you would get about $9,000 in savings, $9,500. And the Redfin agent would make $80,000. But let's look at this again, even at a 15% rebate. You could use any kind of agent you wanted who would agree to the rebate and you would get $12,000 back uh, and that agent would make around $68,000 before their broker. Let's go one further. Buy your home with a Redfin agent for this home and you can get $827 reward. But if you find an agent that's a willing to rebate you 15% of their commission, you could get your own reward of $1,597. And again, Remember, your info is more valuable than just giving you this reward because there are tons of affiliate and other services that they can quote unquote connect you with. So let's talk about real estate agents. It was estimated in 2021 that over 400,000 homes were sold by a real estate agent without buyers knowing it, which means it wasn't really on the market. It wasn't put in the MLS or if it was, it was put up in already under an agreement in less than 24 hours. And it's called a pocket listing, and it's been up 67% since the National Association of Realtors claimed to diminish these pocket listings. And what's more interesting, when NAR enforced rules to ensure that when agents sell a home, every buyer gets access to it, companies began to more promote their exclusive real estate listing. So you can see here, Coldwell Banker, Compass, and even Howard Hanna all have Find It First and other programs in which uh, they have essentially pocket listings that you can't find out about unless you use their agent. But not only does this make the brokerage more money, they're using these exclusive homes, in our opinion, to just bait in new buyers. Here's a social media post from a Compass agent who purposely talked about how they have exclusive properties locally and nationally that aren't available on the open market and that we can help you find them. So they're making more money off of your home uh, for themselves, and they're using your property to bait in new buyers. But what you need to know about these pocket listings is that they aren't on the MLS. They aren't shown to every buyer, and not everyone gets an equal opportunity to view your home and, be a, um, and buy your home. The worst of this is these sales, these pocket listings, can be based on, quote unquote, who fits in. A great article from the New York Times last fall highlighted this exact scenario. This couple looked at a home. They were not the winning offer, but the seller told their agent, I really like them. And I think they'd fit in so well with the neighborhood and how their kids are cute. She gave them a lead about their neighbor who's selling their home down the street. And that's how they got their property. But let's be honest in the United States right now, if this couple had a different skin tone, if they didn't have kids, if they were gay, if they were a different religion, say they were Muslim, would they quote unquote fit in? And so this is where bias, whether it's unconscious or it's just downright racism of how people quote unquote fit in can cause a problem. But more importantly, in this article, the broker that they interviewed about pocket listings finished up her one paragraph about talking about it, saying she doesn't mind because she doesn't have to split the commission. So what does she mean by that? Here's a traditional listing. And let's say the listing agent and the buyer agent work for two different brokerages. So they work for two different offices. Let's say a Remax listing agent and a Coldwell Banker buyer agent. And if the home uh, paid around 5.5%, we're looking at 16,500 in commission. Let's assume that they just split the commission evenly. And so each broker would get almost $2,500. And remember, agents have to pay their broker something. So again, we're going to use this average of 30%. And so the listing agent and buyer agent are walking away with $5,775. But what happens if it's a pocket listing? Because both agents probably work for the same broker, uh, that broker is now making almost $5,000 instead of $2,500. And the agents are still making the same. But then comes another scenario that we've actually encountered a few times when interviewing buyers. It's called dual agency for a dual agent in which the listing agent say they also have a buyer that they're going to represent. 
So it could already be their client, or it could be someone that's just approaching the listing agent um, and they're not being repped by a buyer's agent. So they're just coming in on their own and the listing agent agrees to represent both sides of the deal. The listing agent is now making $11,550. But what you need to know about a dual agency is it can cause some issues. Sometimes it works out great. But if you listen to the Real Estate Replay podcast, there are two buyer stories on there in which they went through dual agency. One, the seller sounds like it lost out on a lot of value in their home. And the other felt they never even heard from the agent as a buyer the minute their inspection was done and that the agent didn't even show up to the closing table. And so while there are agents that can likely do a truthful, transparent, honest dual agency, you need to pay attention to this. And if you're a seller, we've also noted that those two buyer stories you can find on our podcast also talked about how the listing agent made them have their offer expire in less than 24 hours, even though they were showing scheduled the following couple days. So as a seller, you need to be aware of that, that if a listing agent, your listing agent is approaching you as a dual agency, uh, one, depending on how that buyer came about, you shouldn't be paying the standard commission in our opinion. But two, you need to make sure that if the listing agent is working for you and you are paying them, that they're looking out for your best interest. But you also have to look at maybe they don't want to do a dual agent. And they might pull in someone from their office to represent the buyer. But because that agent's just coming in at the end as a referral agent to help the buyer, they're likely going to be paying that listing agent some money. So again, the broker would make twice as much. Uh, the listing agent who found the buyer uh, but had someone else represent them would likely get a nice chunk of whatever whoever represented the buyer. And so the person representing the buyer might get like $3,600, but the listing agent would pick up a referral fee from that person uh, and end up making almost $8,000. And this is why they talk about how it makes them more money because they don't have to split commission. Here's our third concern, and that's iBuyers. In our opinion, they're making homes more expensive and less accessible. If you're not familiar with iBuyers, they get the most praise in the venture capital world. Some companies like Open Door have been flushed with investor cash and have raised almost a billion dollars from investors to run their business. iBuyers buy directly from a homeowner, a, typically a little bit undervalued, and still charge a standard commission. But they hide behind the guise of offering you flexibility. So they let you be more flexible with your closing date. And instead of asking you to do repairs, they'll do an inspection and then just ask you for money. Once you move out, they'll either do the repairs, although in some stories on Reddit, we've read that they didn't do repairs, but that's hearsay. But anyways, so they might do minor adjustments to the home, if at all, and then they relist the home at a higher price. It's like flipping light. But on average, of the properties that we have tracked, Open Door will relist a home they bought for $60,000 more than what they bought it for. And what's most frustrating is to think that a seller would have sold that price point to a buyer if this whole process of buying and selling was just easier. But if you're a buyer and you're looking at open door properties, there's something you need to know. If you go on open door, you will see they encourage you to start an offer right then and there, but they're not showing you exactly the correct information. On the left, you'll see a property sold by Open Door, and on the right is that exact same property on Redfin's website. If you'll notice on Redfin all the way in the bottom, it shows this property was bought by Open Door for $411,000 on February 24th. But if you look at Open Door, it doesn't show you that, and actually it makes it look like the home last sold in 2018. So because the property was bought directly from the homeowner, it shows up under public records. And so Open Door, in our opinion, will likely just say, well, we pull MLS data, that's why it doesn't show. But this is a billion dollar invested company. They have the resources, they should be showing you what they bought the home for. But more importantly, they also don't show you when they reduce the price. Look on the right, the home was actually listed on March 16th for 471. 
But if you look at the left, it just shows you 465. It's really important for buyers to know if there was a price reduction because it tells you there weren't any offers. And it also tells you that the property might be overpriced. But none of this information is shown on the Open Door website. And again, if you notice, when they hide the purchase price, you'll notice the difference in what they bought it for versus what they sold it for was around $60,000. But here's what else you need to know. After Open Door buys a property from a homeowner, they are also selling some of these properties to investors. So we did the month of April. We started to kind of dig into who Open Door is selling to. And so Hillsbury County in Tampa, which is where Open Door has been ravishing the market, they sold 66 homes. So they bought a bunch of homes from homeowners in Tampa. And during the month of April, they sold 66 of them. 20 of them were sold to investors. And eight of those 20s were off market, which means the home buyers didn't even have a chance to know about them because they never hit the market. 46 of them were sold to consumers on the average 60K increase. But what's interesting is the 12 that were on the market many of them sold to the investor below the list price. So they negotiated a little bit with investors, but you don't see that as in common when a consumer buys it. So let's talk about investors. Last year, one in five homes sold to an investor. But if you're looking in the Sunbelt cities, one in four homes sold to a real estate investor. And at the end of the year last year, the final quarter of the year in some of those Sunbelt cities, it was actually one in three. But what we need to be focusing on is who's buying and what are they buying? When you think about an investor, you think about those that go into underserved communities, buy up properties that really need fixed up and flip them and rent them out or sell them. And while there are pros and cons to this, and we can talk about that at a later date, what we need to be focusing on is what these investors are currently buying. And if you look at institutional investors, they're not buying fix and flip homes. A lot of these institutional investors are buying good quality homes and most of them are the 300,000 or lower mark. And so we're mostly first time home buyers and those wanting to even own a home would be looking at. So this is an example of just one institutional investor and the amount of homes that they currently rent in Atlanta. But there's something more that happens with this. If you look at where investors are buying, it's impacting minority communities. A study recently shown in the Washington Post showed that 30% of homes in majority Black neighborhoods were sold to investors versus around 12% in other zip codes, especially white communities. And there's always a debate about if this is targeted or not. Uh, and a lot of times people just choose to ignore the past histories of redlining and how some of these communities came to be and how some of these homes are undervalued. But let's look at the main issue. If a lot of these homes are being purchased in Black communities, it's not going to help the fact that Black home ownership is at 43.4% and remains lower than it was a decade ago. In fact, a recent study showed that Black home ownership was the only one that has not been increasing in the past two years. So Hispanic, Asian, and white all increased in home ownership, but Black home ownership did not. And so whether you want to believe this is targeting towards communities, you have to ask yourself, is this really helping? You can see in Atlanta, 25% of the homes purchased last year were bought by investors. And in 2015, it was 12%. If you look on the left, you'll see the darker the color areas, the heavier investor purchases there were. Some of these right below Atlanta were over 50% of the zip code of the homes sold were bought by investors. On the right, you'll compare it to the diversity map where green is black communities. Same thing with Charlotte. The darker, heavier set colors means the heavier investors. But with Charlotte, just like Atlanta, there's also an intense institutional investor ownership in single family homes. A recent study by UNC Charlotte Urban Institute uh, claimed that there are over 11,000 single family homes in Mecklenburg County uh, that are owned by corporations. And so we talk about mom and pop landlords, but there's also institutional investors that have really upped their game trying to buy single family homes. 
And again, these homes are the 300,000 or lower on average, where most people would want to start to try to start their home ownership journey. And again, look at the institutional purchases and look at the diversity map of Charlotte. One thing to note from this study of the Urban Institute is that they estimated that there are thousands more of these single family homes owned by corporations in the outlying counties um, next to Mecklenburg. Let's look at Cleveland. 16% of homes purchased last year were bought by investors versus 7% in 2015. 22% in Jacksonville, Florida. That's up from 11% in 2018. Cincinnati, 15%, 19% in Detroit. And again, look at where they're purchasing and look at the communities it's impacting. Same thing in Philadelphia, as well as Tampa. Tampa has been a hotbed for investors, uh, which has really ramped up this year as well. And so they ended the year with 18% of homes purchased by investors, but I would venture to say it's gone up from there. But what's interesting is that these investors, especially institutional investors, are blaming millennials for why they need to keep buying and renting out more single family homes. But why? Gary Behrman, I'm sure you've heard of him because he was on the 60 Minute News uh, from Tricon. He's their CEO. And he said, if you asked a lot of millennials, and that tends to be our primary resident, they'd probably tell you they don't necessarily desire to own a home. And sure, there are millennials that don't want to buy a home, but the numbers don't add up because in 2021, millennials made up 43% of home buyers, the most of any generation. And what's worse is when we're talking about low inventory and we need more homes, these institutional investors are now building homes in communities just to rent, single family home communities. This one by American Homes for Rent currently has 130 single family communities in 12 states, all owned by them. And where one person takes off, the rest will follow. Tricon announces new plans to deliver 3,000 build to rent homes. Build to rent communities, are they the new paths to the American dream? 4,000 homes. San Antonio, Austin, and Houston, another group. Another investment group just acquired 87 single family rental homes in one section in Florida. But let's go back to this. Do millennials just wanna rent? Because if you're looking at who made up the majority of home buyers, it's millennials. And if they didn't really want to buy a home, they likely wouldn't have made up such a giant percent. But here's what else we need to focus on. When you're looking at institutional investors, if they can't build a community, they'll just buy portions of it. And so one follower on social media sent me a tip to look up Hawkins Homes. This is a single family home builder in Clarksville, Tennessee, who has a website that shows themselves as the local community builder, and they were born and raised in this community. But according to deed records, it's from January 1st to April 19th, which is when I finished this last study, um, of the homes that they have closed on, so of the homes sold, 30% of them went to just three institutional investors, Westport Capital, First Key Homes, and Tricon Residential. And so again, we talk about low inventory and you have to ask, is this helping? Are we building single family homes to rent or should we be building them to sell to homeowners who are looking to create their own generational wealth, not wealth for a company? And what you also need to know is that being an investor as a mom and pop or as an individual has become the thing to do. The big thing that they claim is to have someone else pay your mortgage, not yours. And I'm not saying that investors shouldn't exist in this market, but in some cities where there are one in four homes being sold to an investors, you have to ask, is that balanced? And as we keep pushing and as more companies come out, making real estate investing the thing to do, it's likely in our opinion, not gonna get any better. <laughs>